I wanted to start off with uh, just a few assumptions that we're, that we're kind of going into this talk with, or this time, this time with, there'll be some hands on. Welcome, come on in. Um, so one of the assumptions I wanted to throw out there is that uh, Google, um, researching things. So I'm gonna try to bring lots of, lots of information and material for you guys today that you can't, you won't necessarily be able to look up on Google because there's lots of stuff you can look up on Google. So my point is, you should, um, I'm, I'm assuming all of you know the, the power of the internet and the ability and the accessibility you all have to understand even the minute details of how many camera systems work and, and lighting rigs and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm going to try to stay away from stuff that you can look up and try to maybe bring some other themes and things to, to help uh, inspire your thinking and maybe challenge your thinking uh, because you have so many, so many tools uh, to allow you to understand almost anything that's a technical detail that you, that you want to know. Um, another assumption I'm going to, uh, going in with this is uh, math. I wish someone would have told me this like back, you know, when I was in eighth grade, like struggling through math class, but math is a language with which we describe everything in the universe. So we can, uh, through, through words, we can describe things in a very imprecise way. That wall is long, um, this ladder is tall. But with math, we can, we can very specifically describe the volume inside one of the bar legs of that ladder. We can describe the surface area of the wall. We can also use math to describe light. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how cameras interact with light, and a lot of that has to do with math, and there's nothing to be afraid of. It's just a language, how we describe that light, the amount of light, the, uh, how long the light's coming in, and so on. So we'll get into that a little bit. Um, Another assumption that, that I'm coming into this is what, that we are, that we all have come to, you know, you guys have come to university um, to, to learn. And so whether you are, I just want to uh, get an idea of, are there any people who like want to be cinematographers? Cool, cool, you can raise them high, that's a, that's a great position. Is there anyone who doesn't want to be a cinematographer but wants to do filmmaking in some other arena? All right, all right. Are there any no votes in the audience? Come on now. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> um, so you can, so you, you, you obviously have so many options of how you interact with the medium of cinema. There's so, many, there's so many tools to play with. It's a playground, it's a big playground. The camera is not the only tool and all of the elements that go inside of camera are not the only tools of cinema. Um, so if you're coming here thinking, I just wanna like be a screenwriter, I just wanna be an actor and like I'm intimidated by the camera. Um, I, just, I just want you to know that uh, we're going to go through some stuff together and I hope that you leave equipped knowing that uh, as a screenwriter, even if you never plan on touching a camera, um, you don't have to be intimidated by it. There's no mystery about it. Hopefully we can demystify some of those things and hopefully you can understand that you have so many tools that make that technology accessible to you and there's such an importance in understanding how a camera works because everything in film comes through the camera. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Later. So anyway, those are some uh, those are some some mindset, some frames of uh, of mind that we're going through this with. So I wanted to start off by just breaking down. They asked me to talk about cameras and how they work. So we could talk all day um, about very specific details. What I want you guys to uh, what I wanted to equip you guys with is sort of an understanding of how to think of a camera. Are there any? Is there anybody here just out of curiosity that sort of like doesn't really understand what exactly goes into a camera? Hey, thanks for raising your hand. Cool, thanks. That's good. I, I actually thought I knew a lot about cameras and then I would hit some sort of milestone and I'd go, oh my gosh, I don't understand. Um, so it's, it's totally a good place, uh, especially here at a school. Um, sometimes it can feel sort of daunting, like, oh, everybody else knows more than me or whatever. Or um, sometimes it can feel daunting if you know a lot that you can't reveal that you don't know everything. That can be sort of daunting. I just want you to know this is a safe place. This is a totally safe place. So we're gonna break down the basics of, um, of how a camera works. So everything that every camera that you've ever worked with or that you've ever seen that has ever been invented since the beginning of cameras and probably will ever be invented is basically just doing three things. Uh, and this is specifically with light. Um, size, time, and sensitivity is basically the, that's, that's all a camera's doing. Whether it's your iPhone, whether it's the Alexa 65, whether it's a 70 mil film camera, I think they're all doing the same basic elements with light. So my goal in, in uh, sharing this with you guys is so that you can understand whenever you pick up a camera, whenever you see a camera, you know that no matter how fancy it is, it's basically just doing these three things. Um, so the first thing is, is iris. So the iris is, is 
that ring that's around the outside of the lens. It's got a bunch of numbers on it, and that's telling us, um, that's controlling the size. And that's literally the amount of light that's coming through the lens. That is, the math on that is the f-stop. That's how we measure that light that's coming through in a numerical way so that we can be precise. So that when we're shooting um, a wide shot of a scene and then we cut to a close-up on a different lens, we can be precise about our f-stop reading. We can be precise about the amount of light that's coming through the lens because we've got numbers that help us, you know, we're going to shoot this at a four and then we're going to pop in and we're going to still be at a four. And we're going to make sure that we adjust our lights accordingly. So the next, uh, the next basic thing that, that a camera is doing with light is time. So it's uh, the, sh the shutter, which I've got a, a, just a picture of an electronic shutter. I think that's actually from a still, um, like a DSLR or, or a mirrorless. Um, so the shutter is the thing that opens and closes to let light in. And the thing that that's controlling is time. It's literally how long are you allowing light to hit the sensor. And that's controlled by shutter speed. You'll see that sometimes in fractions. Um, like one fiftieth of a second, one two hundredth of a second, one eighth of a second. Sometimes you'll see that in degrees. Um, back in the film camera days, uh, like with this guy, there would be a, an actual uh, round rotating shutter inside of there, and you would actually measure how long the light was coming in by the degree angle of that, that round wheel. Um, so you'll see it measured sometimes in both ways. Um, so we have size, we have uh, the time is the shutter speed, that's literally how long it's coming through. And then we have the image sensor, which is controlling the sensitivity. And that's how well is that sensor going to react to the light? Um, is it going to be a, so I guess the best way to explain this would be uh, back in film days, strip of film had a bunch of chemicals on it. So the light would come through, the amount of light would come through for a certain amount of time and would hit the piece of film and it would literally explode the crystals on the sheet of film. This is literally an explosive process that's happening on a microscopic level. So uh, the question of sensitivity is how fast do those things explode? If you have a very slow speed stock, it's not going to explode very quickly. It has, um, it's actually that the grains are very, very tiny. So the, the stock would be um, really sharp, but it would be less light sensitive. And then, you know, the inverse is true. If it's a faster stock, then it's it's exploding quicker, and the grains are larger, and so on, so it's more light sensitive. It's able to literally take in more light. With, um, with digital chips, it's the same thing. We have the ability to crank it lower or higher, less light sensitive, more light sensitive, depending on your, um, on your, on your uh, setting. So your iPhone is doing all of these things. It just so happens your iPhone is doing them all automatically without your control, unless you download an app that allows you to have individual control over your ISO, shutter speed, and your f-stop. Um, we'll have a little bit of a time. Actually, if there are any like burning questions at the moment about something that's up here, I'm happy to answer a few if you'd like. But if you guys are good, we can also move on. Cool. So that's kind of basics of, um, basics of camera. Um, next, I wanted to just kind of run you guys through um, camera team. And this is kind of everything that goes into, all of the people that go into the camera department on a, on a film set. And so at the top of your, um, of your departments of camera and lighting is actually the cinematographer, the DP, director of photography. Um, so they're actually overseeing both departments. They're overseeing um, all of the lighting, which is grip and electric, and they're overseeing all, all of the camera team. So for example, I was shooting a feature film in Manila, and I was the cinematographer of that, that film. And I had two departments. They were both um, a pretty small crew, but we had you know, two separate departments that were doing totally different things. And um, so I had to kind of oversee where are we hanging lights, where are the lights coming from, but also I had to oversee. We had multiple cameras and so on, and uh, multiple languages and all kinds of things. So they're, the cinematographer's kind of overseeing that whole process, and they're funneling the director's vision through a very visual medium. They're saying, okay, this is, what you, this is the feel you want. This is literally, in math, how we can achieve that. This is what you want for this feel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to translate that feel into f-stop, shutter speed, and ISO. We're going to uh, figure out how to do that. So uh, the camera operator is literally, uh, and on many sets, the DP often camera operates. But on bigger um, TV shows, movies, a lot of union projects, you'll have uh, a camera operator. The DP will be sitting back at the monitor with the director. They're talking, they're talking uh, overall big picture, and the camera operator is the one that's actually on the camera. Um, 
and I can answer any questions about uh, any of these positions. I've worked in, in all of these positions in various kind of productions, so you can kind of hit me with any questions you have about that. Um, as a job, camera operating is really fun because you kind of just show up, everything's already set up, you show up, you operate it, and you just walk away and you get a paycheck, and it's like, it's kind of cool. Whereas the DP is there for weeks beforehand, and they're setting everything up, and they're talking to every wardrobe and so on. Um, so when you're starting out and learning, camera operating can be a really great job. Um, the first AC, does anybody know what AC stands for? Assistant camera, totally. I'm not totally sure why it's not camera assistant, but it's cool. Uh, the first AC is, they're like, they are like the mother hen of the camera. The camera is always with them, and they get in trouble if they are seen without the camera. You know, they're, they're always with the camera. They go grab lunch, and they go sit next to the camera. They just make sure that the camera's okay. But when, when the shot is happening, they're actually in charge of focus. And this job, like all of these jobs, has morphed so much over time because of the changes in technology and so on. But um, back in the day, film ACs would have no monitor that they're looking at because the operator's looking through a glass, literally a glass eyepiece. So there's no monitor on this. There's no, no way of the first AC knowing how to even you know, uh, know if the shot is in focus. So they would measure and they would learn how to eyeball the distance. I don't know if you guys have probably heard about this sort of unique kind of superhuman skill. Um, but they would, they would, you'd see them walking around the measuring tape and they'd sort of, you know, try to figure out that's like probably four feet six and then like, oh, yes. you know, and they'd like be kind of just judging distance and learning how to, how to perceive numbers. You, literally they're learning how to uh, explain mathematically the distance from here to there. Because then when it comes to, when the camera's rolling, their job is to follow the actors or follow the moment or whatever's happening. Um, so the first AC is a very technical, very technical role. It's a really tough role. I first AC'd on a couple features back to back one year. Um, right, actually right after I left APU, um, it was two four week feature film shoots back to back and four of those weeks were all night shoots. So it was like a vampire, it was really weird. It was like a strange alternate reality where I was just absorbed in this kind of camera world. And so I, I, after a while I started to like really get pretty good at you know, judging, that's like 12 feet, you know, eight, inches, eight inches or whatever. And we'd, the first and second AC and I would like have contests, you know, like okay, who, can, who can figure out most accurately the distance from here to there, you know, whatever, just goofing around. Um, so really, really fun role, very highly technical, and it's a good, if you have any skills or um, if you're, you have like a character trait that is good for like focus, sometimes that's actually a really good role because you're really focusing on certain details and you're doing those things very uh, accurately. The second AC is, uh, they're really in charge of operating the slate. So they're actually the connection of the camera department to post-production. Um, you guys have all seen a slate. Uh, so all of that information is super important because you're a system editor, which you guys have all experienced, I'm sure. Are you guys in the process of editing any projects at the moment? So you guys know, like, if you look at a shot and there's no slate, like, what is this? Is this, like, some random, who, is this some, from someone's iPhone? Like, where does this come from? Um, so on, on union sets, like there's, there's a really sharp protocol, a really strict protocol of the, the first time, the first frame the camera sees is actually with the slate. Because we don't want any lag time, we don't want to waste time, we don't want to waste film or hard drive space, terabytes. Um, but we also just want to know right away for the assistant editor because the studio is a big system and we're just cranking out products so we need to go as efficiently as possible. Um, so the second AC has a really important job of keeping track of the slate, marking on the slate, uh, what shot is this, what scene is this, what sound roll is this, and so on. Um, and no one else is in charge of that. So the second AC has a really tough job because if they set down the slate somewhere and then it gets picked up and put on a cart or taken away somewhere, then the movie no, no longer has a slate. And that's very, very difficult. So they have a big responsibility. Um, then there's also, they're assisting the first AC with, with focus. So I talked about how the first AC is eyeballing um, eyeballing distances and something that they use to eyeball distances is a mark on the floor, say this piece of green tape. That would that'd be something that the second AC would, would put down during a rehearsal. Um, there's a pretty well laid out uh, rehearse, you know, block, sh uh, light, rehearse, and then shoot kind of process on most union sets. And so that's a really key part of that rehearsal. The second AC and first AC are watching to see what are the actors doing Okay, so they're going to come around here, they're going to stop there, we need to put a mark there. So the first AC knows, okay, that's where we're measuring and so on. So the second AC and first AC, are, uh, they're working kind of as a, a, a tight unit. 
really every, everybody in this department is. Uh, and then the camera, camera PA is assisting on large sets. There's a mountain of cases and a, and a pile of gear inside of each of those cases. So the camera PA is running back and forth oftentimes. Um, hey, we need this, this O-ring for a map box. OK, run back and get it. You know, the camera PA is also a, a trainee. They're kind of learning and hopefully working their way up in this, in this group. Does anybody know what the union is for the camera department, the, the number? It's the local 600. IATSE 600 is the, the camera union. So you'll, you'll discover as you kind of interact more with the industry, um, a lot of the jobs are broken up into unions and they'll have, you know, local 33 is the stagehands union and so on. Um, local 600 is the camera union. So you might jump in as a second AC and then you'd work your way up through several days uh, of, of a certain level of pay and you work your way up to a first AC and a camera operator and so on. Um, so we can talk more in, in, when we have time for questions, you guys can hit me with questions about union and things like that. I'm, I'm not union, um, but I've, I've got a lot of people, friends who are union and I've kind of interacted in that world quite a bit. Um, I wanted to say one more thing about camera team. I think this is pretty important. Um, the, the, there's a certain vibe on set. I don't know, have, have you guys been on any sets outside of student film sets? Has anybody been on a couple ones? What, what were you on? Yeah, like what, what, what kind I of, what, what, okay, yeah, so indie films. Anybody else, anybody else been on any kind of sets that aren't, that aren't student sets? Um, and sometimes you'll see this even on student sets. I mean, um, there's, a, there's a certain vibe sometimes about camera department that it's kind of, it's sort of somewhat, somewhat elevated. There's lots of expensive gear and, uh, and it seems like everyone's serving the camera department. You have everyone running up to the camera operator or the DP, you know, does this look good, you know, whatever. Does it look good for camera? Um, and there's a certain ethos that uh, I remember when I was a student at APU, it was like cool to be a, you know, oh yeah, I'm gonna be a DP, yeah, it's cool. I know all this stuff about everything, you know, whatever. Um, I, I know that because I was totally one of those people. I would sit in the middle of the class and dominate conversation about cameras and look at how cool I am because I can remember lots of numbers. But um, what, I, what I, I, th I think I've learned since that experience and, and since this whole experience of going through camera department on many different film sets is that uh, ultimately we're serving. We're serving each other as artists, as humans, as artists, and as filmmakers, we're serving each other. So when we step on set, um, we are actually serving, as camera department, we are serving everybody on the production. Because in the world of cinema, everything comes through the porthole of the camera. So the audience doesn't see anything unless it comes through the camera. You could look at that and say, oh, a camera is the most important. But if we understand something about the kingdom of heaven, we understand that things are actually sometimes a bit flipped around. That actually the camera department are, they're the people who has the, have the largest responsibility to serve on a, camera, on, a, on a film set. So if someone's doing wardrobe, um, the camera department's job is to make sure that that wardrobe person gets like an Oscar for their wardrobe, that it looks as, as, as good as it can look. That the way that they're framing, lighting, exposing, focusing, is serving that work of art as much as possible. If someone else is, you know, if, if you're an actor or if, if, if you're a writer, we, we as the camera department are serving that art form. We're making sure that that art form is making it in its, uh, in its most beautiful state through, through the lens as much as we can do. And so then lighting is aiding in that and so on. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's a really important way of looking at it, that we are ultimately serving, we are serving each other and ultimately as a crew we're serving the vision of the story. We're serving the story. And we can relate that to the fact that we're serving God, who is creating, creating this story that we're all collectively a part of. Um, so I think the way that we approach a film set can be dramatically changed by the way that we view ourselves as, as artists. Um, and when we see the camera as a, a portal through which everything comes, we can understand our, our goal and our position to serve. Any, thought, any, any questions before we jump into that that might help you guys what we're about to do. Hit me with it. So why did you want to become a film Oh, that's a great question. That's good. I should have led with that. That's good. Um, <laughs> you know, actually, I, so I actually came from like an acting background. When I, when I, I'm from Chicago. I grew up in Chicago, uh, suburb of Chicago, really. And I was pumped about acting. And so I was in, I was actually in a high school. Um, it was like a visual, visual and performing arts academy. So like the last two periods of my day were all just theater. Um, and we had to make these we had to make these, see these skits at the end of our, 
the end of our time, at the end of our, you know, like a thesis, uh, one X, that's what it was, a one X. So we had to write it or, or create one uh, or, or find one. And I just asked them, you know, I, I'd been messing around with cameras and I was like, can I, can I do a, a film of the same length? It was like a 20 minute deal. They said, yeah. And so I just, I didn't know anything about filmmaking. I literally didn't know anything about filmmaking other than just watching movies and really loving them. So I created the whole process from beginning to end. I wrote it. I figured out how to schedule, how to break all the scenes into different schedules, and I had like highlighters, and I color coded things, and I made all. The, I mean, it was, it was so much fun. Like I freaking loved it, and got all, all of my friends to be in it, and and I was in it, and I mean, it was it was a blast. But the thing that I really uh, kind of fell in love with, with was the fact that you can put this story through through the lens, and you can you can actually change the way that an audience perceives a certain moment. An actor doing the same thing on two different takes will look entirely different based on if you're close with a wide lens or far away with a telephoto. And I just like really liked the fact that you could, you could sort of uh, manipulate things to create a certain emotional response. And I think for me, the, the love of cinematography kind of went in conjunction with editing, the way that you could sort of cut things together. So for me, it was sort of a um, uh, one single kind of flow process. But I started goofing around with our home video camera and I would make stop action videos with our little, you know, you know that game Risk? Yeah. There's the little soldiers. It's like a board, world, world domination game. There's little tiny little pieces, of little tiny soldiers. You're supposed to use them, you know, whatever. I would flip the board over to the black side and I would line up these two armies, you know, like with all the pieces and have the cotton balls and so on. It would be like stop action, like for hours, you know, like it's a little, it was so much fun. It was just weird. And uh, I would hang out with my friends and we'd make, you know, uh, films usually about, you know, just guns and violence and, you know. It's so American, it's terrible. Um, but I, I just really loved, I just really loved uh, putting things through the camera. And then the more I got into it, once I came to APU, I just, I was shooting everybody's projects. So people would, would, uh, would say, oh yeah, I'm shooting something, and everyone wanted to direct it. And I'd be like, dude, let me shoot it, let me shoot it. Like, I'm so pumped to shoot that. Um, and I would just be shooting everybody's stuff as much as I could, or, or helping them in some way. So I just kind of, kind of, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, hit me. <laughs> What's your name, by the way? Ethan. Ethan, cool. Uh, oh, that I've done. That's a really, that's a really good question. <laughs> Man, solid. You should be up here. This is good. Uh, you know, th I mean, I guess there are different productions. So the, I mentioned the feature that I shot in the Philippines. That was in 2013. Um, that was that was probably the most trying experience I've I've ever had. Just, Shooting a feature is, is, a, is a marathon in and of itself, but there were a whole layer of things that went into that that were really uh, interesting budget constraints, and we were shooting in the slums of Manila, and just, uh, you know, just kind of an intense place to shoot a film, and uh, especially one that had kind of a low, low budget, so there's not much buffer between you and just kind of the world that's like happening. Um, there were riots on set because we were firing off blanks at 3 a.m., like in a super densely crowded slum, and, so there are things like that, that that added to a certain uh, challenge. So I think I actually grew the most maybe as a, a leader because um, I was leading a team and I had leaders over me and so on. And so I was, I was probably interacting the most with leadership challenges on that production. Um, I would say maybe one of the films I'm most proud of is a short film called How to Get Married in 117 Days, which was a film that my wife and I made together with a couple other people. Um, and we, I can give you guys a link to that or we can watch it at the end or whatever. It's, it's like 17 minutes, so it's kind of long, but um, I can make that available to you guys. And that was a film that we, it was like an adventure film, kind of. We wrote this script and we did the whole thing in about six to eight weeks and we showed the film in our wedding reception. It was kind of our way of showing, telling uh, our friends and family like uh, the story of how we met, even though it was like highly dramatized and fantasized. It was really fun to make. Um, so we made, that, we made that up in the Angeles National Forest. And we would just go up there like every weekend, pretty much, <laughs> go shoot that with some friends. And uh, a lot of APU people actually worked on that. So, um, or I should say, former APU people. Uh, so yeah, I mean, those are some films that stand out. There, yeah, there are things I've definitely learned from every every production I've I've been on. <laughs>